Hello, everybody. Welcome uh, to this session. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Jess Austin from the Royal Society of Protection of Birds. This society is not caring only about birds, but uh, also about uh, biodiversity in uh, general. And she is very relevant to, to our unit called Synergetic Landscape uh, that is active in Grangetown because their um, society has been active in Grangetown as well. And uh, they implemented the biodiversity bricks into Grangetown Pavilion. And uh, in general, they, their activities are very inspiring. So please uh, take, uh, take an advantage of the great potential uh, inspiration and uh, just please uh, welcome. Thank you. The stage is yours. by the RSPB and I'm here today to talk about designing with nature. I also studied architecture for my undergraduate degree and I'm kind of looking forward to kind of putting together the two topics here of, of architecture and design. Um, the next slide please, Mary. So this project is a partnership project with uh, uh, the RSPB Bug Life Cymru and Cardiff Council, and we're funded by the National Lottery Community Fund. And we're operating on this project from 2020, 2017 to 2022. Next slide, please. The vision for this project is for children, families, and communities across Cardiff to feel connected to the wildlife on their doorstep and enabled to take action for nature. Next slide, please. This is because a study by the RSPB found out that only one in eight children in Wales have a reasonable connection with nature. And this was actually quite a shocking find because it was actually much lower in Wales than it was over the rest of the UK, including even some of the um, more urban areas and even areas such as London. Next slide, please. And so the goals of our project are to connect people with nature. So an increased number of young people and families regularly outdoors experiencing enjoying nature to collaborate to create an increased number of regular opportunities for young people and families to gain and develop new skills um, encouraging greater levels of community engagement with nature and then finally to change so for local environments enhanced through sustained community action increasing levels of community ownership and engagement and providing benefits for local biodiversity and empowering more young people and families to take independent and local action for nature. Thank you. Next slide, please. So why is connection to nature important? Um, disconnection to nature is considered one of the major problems facing nature conservation. The term is used to describe our attitude towards nature, our emotional relationship, along with our knowledge and behavior. So connection to nature is more than just liking nature and spending time in there, but it's a quite a kind of there's a whole theory around nature connection pathways, which is something you might want to look up afterwards. And these are kind of five main channels that we can kind of grow to feel connected to the nature. But we're also that it's becoming increasingly important that if we're not connected to nature, how are we going to want to save biodiversity and also kind of the planet kind of going forwards if we're kind of increasingly not going to be having that relationship. Next slide, please. So this is from a State of Nature report in 2019, which was from 50 um, organizations all pulling together data from across the UK. Um, and some pretty stark figures in here, probably not, um, you know, you're probably familiar with these, but kind of 15% of species are threatened with extinction um, in Great Britain alone. Um, and 133 of eight, over just over 8,000 were actually already became extinct um, within Great Britain. So, there's quite a lot of statistics out there in terms of nature's declines, but also that we kind of have to stay hopeful that there are things that we can do to, to try and stop this. Next slide, please. So why is wildlife facing such dramatic declines? So we have habitat loss, um, which can be in the forms of through urbanization or agriculture, habitat fragmentation, um, which can be caused by kind of roads, again, urbanization, um, and kind of change of use of different habitats and that can kind of cause populations to be isolated and no longer be able to reproduce and move across um, spaces. Um, we also obviously have pollution in terms of water and soil and air 
from lots of different types of pollution and invasive species which can kind of outcompete um, native species um, or just completely kind of take over a space. So in the plants, I guess you've got things like rhododendron, um, and then, you know, there's, there's loads of examples in um, mammals and insects, but you can know a kind of big one, I guess, even for the red squirrel is the, the grey squirrel and how they've kind of outcompeted, um, at least in the UK. And, you know, the red squirrel now has a number of conservation projects around it. And lastly, you know, the, the big one there is, is climate change. So climate change is causing species to kind of change their distribution. Um, but also their behaviours, depending on how they're linked to um, seasons and, yeah, natural uh, uh, things that could cause different parts in their life cycle through the, the seasons and the time of year. However, um, you know, I'm a firm believer that cities can be part of the solution in, in helping turn this around. Next slide, please. So today, 55% of the world's population lives in urban spaces, and that's expected to increase um, to 68% by 2050. So it's not something that we can really ignore urban spaces as being bad for nature or not relevant, um, because not only are these spaces, you know, huge, large spaces, but also this is where the people are. And so if we're not engaging with people in urban spaces with nature, then who's, who's going to be the ones caring? Um, and also trying to make a difference for the environment longer term. Next slide, please. So um, the biggie one here is, is carbon in the built environment. So we've kind of got two big parts here. We've got embodied carbon, um, which is the emissions caused by the materials and systems within a building. So um, material extraction, manufacturing, transportation, assembly and maintenance. Um, even down to the replacement, deconstruction and disposal of the things that you've made your project or your building of. And then you've got the operational carbon. So once that thing's made and whilst it's in use, what other carbon does it need to, you know, heat it, cool it, maintain it, um, supply electricity, um, everything that goes around that and kind of combining the two is that when you end up getting the kind of carbon and combined greenhouse gas effect of, of one building or infrastructure project. Um, this isn't my huge area of expertise, this particular part, but um, this information was from the UK's Green Building Council's report um, tackling embodied carbon in buildings. And they have a huge amount of resources um, uh, on their website that I've uh, obviously you've now got the link to this presentation, but um, you know it's worth checking out on there in terms of low carbon and sustainable design. Next slide, please. And this is important um, because buildings and construction um, and their operations actually account for, they're estimating 39% of energy related carbon emissions. Um, this is a, a global report from the United Nations. And this was, these kind of stats were what really struck me when I was studying architecture and how um, environment, environmental design is actually more than kind of using recycled materials and you know having uh, energy efficient buildings it actually is part of a parcel of you know where are the materials coming from how are we creating things and what is the impact of that and how can we minimize it um, next slide please so some initial points to consider there with um yeah, how, you know, where is carbon in the process of your project? Is, you know, how will you source your materials? What's the environmental impact of them? Are there any alternatives that you could use that would have a lower impact? Um, what will be the energy requirements for your project to operate in terms of heating, lighting and maintenance? Um, what will happen at the end to your project at the end of its life? So if we're talking about a building here, you know, what happens to the materials involved in that? But if you're talking about an installation, what happens to the materials that you've used? And also, how can you minimize waste during the, the deconstructions? These are just some initial questions that came to mind, but I'm sure when you start to think about this as a process from where do all the parts come from to make the thing and the actual process of making something to, to the end of its life. So um, Cardiff's wildlife, um, here's a few species that we do have living in the city. So first up, we've got swifts, and um, then we have the peregrine falcon, and then we have a bee orchid hedgehogs and the, the otters so we have some absolutely amazing wildlife that lives here in the city um and it's not always obvious you've got to kind of sometimes got to know where to look um but i think it's really worth you know 
building on what we've got here and celebrating that. So we're going to talk now a little bit more about creating homes for, for nature in the city. Next slide, please. So one of the ways that we've been doing that in, in Cardiff and actually the RSPB does this across the UK is through the, the SWIFT survey. Um, the SWIFT survey is an annual survey um, where SWIFTs, uh, which are a bird, um, we go around the city and volunteers go out and find where these SWIFTs are nesting. So SWIFTs come over every single summer um, from across Africa, different areas. They kind of come up here to breed and they have this huge migration and they love to live in a nest in the roof tiles of old buildings and stone walls, um, kind of in tiny little holes. Um, but the problem is as we kind of um, redevelop our properties and demolish old buildings, actually with swifts are in a quite steep decline, it's not entirely sure where on their migration route what's causing these declines but the point of the survey is to figure out where they're already nesting so we can look at where those sites are that need to be protected so something um these links will work in the uh area that you've got but there's a link there to the to the swift survey and the there's a swift mapper app that you can use as well to kind of um see more about this and also get download the data for your specific area so you could download the data for cardiff and and see what's there Next slide, please. So this is um, some of the data that was uh, found for for around here in terms of where swifts were um, were confirmed to nesting and then to where they are now um, or more recently. And obviously, there's some quite um, stark declines there over quite a short period of time. Next slide, please. Uh, we're going to skip that one because it's a video, but um, when you share the link, you can um, watch the video. So you may have seen um, Swift Tower down at Cardiff Bay. So this was led by a project by um, Glamorgan Bird Club um, alongside the Cardiff Harbour Authority and the RSPB. And this is a kind of purpose built Swift Tower for um, Swifts to come and nest in. Um, so there's, you'll see on the picture, there's loads of different nest boxes in this kind of quite tall V. And there's a little sound recorder on it, um, where it's got solar panels to make a sound of the birds to attract them to come and use this tower. It was only put up, um, I think, about a year and a half ago now. And um, it takes a couple of years for them to try to find these new towers. Um, so kind of we're keeping an eye out, especially this year, to see if they'll be starting to, to make their home. But it's worth a look down at um, Cardiff Bay once you're allowed to go out. Next slide, please. Um, and these are also some other examples of where people are making homes for Swift. So we've got here ones that are being built into the wall, uh, ones that are under the eaves of houses. And then also there's a project to kind of put them in towers. So I believe that's in a, in a church tower in, in Canton. I think it might not be, definitely in Cardiff. And um, yeah, there's lots of different ways you can kind of attach different areas. Um, to sorry to attach different houses for swifts onto buildings next slide please and there's also other initiatives so london has been uh, really innovative in creating this idea of a london national park city um which brings about the idea that um you know the city has people it has green spaces and actually we need to start thinking about cities as if they were national parks and that we put in the val um put in the effort to make sure that the green spaces there are really really good for, for wildlife but also for people um, and also to make sure that coming back to that connection to nature that people do care about the natural environment so they've been doing quite a lot of um, really interesting work even in terms of creating um, national park city rangers so these are people that are in the city and that might come from all different types of um, disciplines that might be artists or um, writers or even people into kind of running and walking to kind of engage more and different people with the green spaces on their doorstep. Um, this has um, been had conversations about of maybe trying to do something similar to this in Cardiff. Um, so this isn't something that I'm personally leading on, but um, have been involved in conversations with it. So you can check out the kind of where that's at on, on Twitter. And there's lots of kind of discussions about how can we kind of connect more people um, in the city with the environment. Next slide, please. 
And this here is kind of, we've got lots of different ideas about how different animals are welcome on, or not welcome in the city. So we've got here, obviously, the, the seagulls, um, you know, there's lots of seagulls in Car Cardiff and often kind of have quite a negative press. And then again, with some of kind of got here, the secret world of London's urban foxes. Um, I think people have a bit of a love hate relationship with the foxes there. And then we've got um, a more um, extreme example of a, a mountain lion in um, Los Angeles, um, all where animals kind of have a bit of a kind of there's a bit of friction there between the relationship the animals have with the with the people that live there and I think that's something that needs to be considered um you know when when discussing these sorts of things because not everyone is open to having more wildlife in the city and you know it needs to be quite carefully managed in terms of the how we talk about it but then also how we go about you know promoting more wildlife in the city and in some circumstances next slide please um, so this is an example that the RSVB has been working with, um, not me personally, um, but it's been working with Barrett Home Developments um, and Aylesbury Vale District Council um, to set a new benchmark for wildlife friendly housing. So this is, uh, I believe, a trial where the housing developers were working with the RSPB to make sure that environmentally friendly fixtures were put into place from the beginning so you know um not just kind of like wildfire uh, sorry wildlife friendly planting but also things like uh bee bricks um, bird boxes um you know making sure there's connectivity between the gardens um so that different animals could get through even things like ponds um so it kind of uh, not only the the plot itself with the house on but then the the surrounding landscape that's been taken in with the the development Next slide, please. And then, yeah, back onto that um, subject of connectivity. So there's a charity called Hedgehog Street who kind of make sure to try and get more hedgehogs into people's gardens. That one of the, the biggest threats to hedgehogs at the moment is the fact that their habitat is really fragmented and they really need small holes cut in the bottom of fences or walls to make sure that they can go around and find food, find other hedgehogs. And they've kind of gone through this, uh, this campaign of, of creating hedgehog highways so you can have whole streets um, kind of come together and try to, to create, make sure that the whole street is, is good for hedgehogs, which I think is a really, really good example of, uh, you know, promoting wildlife in the city. Next slide, please. Another one here is Bug Life um, are creating these things called beelines. So they've basically been identifying where habitat could be connected to help promote different bee species uh, across the UK but this is the network in Wales and there's actually a bee line identified through the centre of Cardiff and along the coast and this is an area where they're kind of really keen to kind of get more wildflowers um, and and other nesting habitats as well for for bees and hopefully the idea there is if you've got this line of connectivity that actually the populations can um can mix and also be a lot more resilient. Next slide, please. Um, and then we've got here the idea of with connectivity is, is tunnels. So I believe the one, the image on the left is a, is a dormouse bridge. And then we've got a, a kind of salmon or a fish ladder um, on the right there. So in kind of all terms of infrastructure schemes, we're starting to see in some cases more thought going into what impact is this going to have on you know the wildlife that would normally use this route and what do we need to be put in to um to mitigate for that um probably the examples are few and far between at the moment but this is the kind of thing you can be thinking of um with your projects in terms of designing within the city you know is something you're thinking of putting there going to be blocking other things um and yeah definitely understanding a bit more about what's what actually lives in the sites that you're, you're working on. Next slide, please. And yes, so we've then got the idea of new builds. So back to kind of um, the developer model, if you like, but these are things that anyone anyone could do. So where we've got swift bricks and, and B bricks that could be built into new, um, new buildings and also, you know, any, maybe in the garden or in the street um, and make it kind of a permanent fixture next slide please 
And also we've got the ideas of um, kind of upcycling and DIY. So there on the right, we've got a, a living wall that has just been made of plastic bottles um, hanging from the walls. I guess a very kind of like low low tech answer. And then there on the, the left, we've got a kind of more more traditional living wall with all kinds of succulents. And actually, you know, there's lots of conversations around, you know, green roofs, green walls, um, you know, where we can and actually, you know, could that be hugely beneficial for the city in terms of both air quality, but also, you know, uh, drainage, uh, if, if there's a lot of waters being held in vegetation rather than just being straight run off into the, into the road. There's quite a lot of opportunities there in terms of green roofs and even on just quite a small small scale with green walls. Um, next slide please. Uh, so these next two are just some videos that I put in at the end that um, you can watch separately. So um, in summary we're kind of seeing massive declines in wildlife and increasing disconnection with nature. Um, the built environment and urbanisation is responsible for a large percentage of global carbon emissions and habitat loss um, and sustainable design has never been more urgent. So I think it's really exciting that you're obviously doing, doing this course and have chosen to do this course. Um, and cities provide an opportunity to engage communities with the natural world and create a habitat where humans and other wildlife can coexist. Um, does anybody have any questions? Well, thank you so much, Jess. Uh, it's it's really exciting, and uh, your involvement in my unit, whenever possible, is uh, very much welcome because uh, because <laughs> it's uh, really great. Thank you so much. I I actually to be to be selfish, I will take the opportunity to ask the question if it's okay. <laughs> yeah, no. uh, I would like to ask talking about Cardiff. Uh, and talking about Cardiff Bay and that uh, that uh, fish bridge, I believe is from the Cardiff Bay, right? I think so. That might not be the Cardiff Bay one, but there is one at Cardiff Bay. Yeah, yeah. My question is, uh, I mean, uh, why actually the the barrage built and uh, what? I mean, it it sounds to me like crazy effect on the biodiversity together with the with the stadium that uh, I believe there were wetlands before, right? Uh, I was informed. Um, what uh, what uh, what effect on biodiversity does it have? And actually, uh, I mean, of course, uh, they like to have boats from uh, the city center to to the and there is a marina in Cardiff Bay, but. Uh, is there some uh, real reason that would be that could be justified for uh, something that has such an effect on uh, on biodiversity? I know that it's from different times, so people had a different uh, perception that time. But could you talk a bit about more about that for us? Because the students are also coming uh, from abroad, and uh, we don't really know uh, exactly the context. Yeah. So I'm not the Cardiff Bay development was quite a bit before kind of my time in a way but I'm aware that it was quite a controversial development when it when it happened because previously the barrage wasn't there and so um, the whole area was tidal so there were huge kind of mud flats and a wetland zone where the bay is now um, and I believe there were a lot of um, kind of there was a lot of wildlife that was reliant on that area. I'm fairly certain that that's part of the reason why um, the RSPB's Newport Wetlands was formed because there was kind of a mitigation uh, area where they kind of um, potentially I would like to check that <laughs> um, but I think that's Sorry. what's happened happened and yeah there is still a huge amount of wildlife around the bay and especially on the Taff so the Taff and all the rivers in Cardiff you know going back much further than that would have been hugely polluted from kind of industry in the valleys and also in the city um, and the rivers were kind of dead zones um, and they have kind of massively over time they have you know they're still I, th I believe they are still pretty polluted rivers um but there is now more wildlife in them so at points there are um the otters kingfishers um quite a lot of kind of yeah fish species um but you you know you'll see even just walking along Taff, there's quite a lot of pollution there and even in terms of kind of plastic litter um and there yeah, are and groups that um, the there's groups going to the sea so yes, there's a, there's a, I think it's called the bucket boat. There's a boat that um, collects um, all the plastic that comes to the rivers before it goes into the bay, or it might be 
before it goes into the sea from the bay and they f- f- sort this out so they take all the wood and then they dry all the wood and use it um i believe they use it for either wood chip in the parks or um i think some of it is used for potentially fuel and then the plastics taken out and what can be recycled is recycled um so they have got a process of um yeah taking the and in some ways that's that's a really good thing with the barrage is it can you know stops that waste going straight out to sea um the kind of plastic and man-made waste that comes through down the rivers thank you so i hope, hope that answers that question i don't know the history of the bay too well um but um yeah i could send you some links that's uh, that would be interesting for me to know because uh, because I asked many people and nobody really gave me the clear answer. <laughs> I I know the, mm. uh, where, where is the stadium where uh, where damaged because of the stadium which is uh, which is just crazy. It's it's un- unjustifiable, right? But uh, I don't really know about all the concept of the of the of the rivers. But does anybody have any questions? Please uh, go ahead, unmute yourself. Uh, uh, The best would be if you can uh, show yourself on the video as well uh, in case your connection allows. But uh, again, repeating this session is recorded and uh, will be will be put uh, put online. So uh, if you if you don't want to be recorded, uh, skip it. Oh, hi, this is Magda. Just so I have a, uh, want to say thank you for to Jazz for this um, presentation. Thank you, um, Marie, for organizing this event. Uh, I just want to ask uh, Jazz about uh, w- working with house housing developers because uh, uh, it's interesting to see all these new interventions like the um, uh, hedgehog corridor or street. And um, how many? Uh, are, are housing developers required now to provide by law uh, protections for species that could be disturbed or displaced as the result of uh, their uh, implementation of projects? Mm. That's a good question. Um, I believe there are there are things like that are protected species. So that's when people end up coming and doing BAT surveys on new developments. Um, and there are a few other species that are kind of protected species as well, but I think bats is the, the main one. So if you know that you are, um, you kind of have to have a bat survey done when you'll be doing a new development and then people will come in. And if you are, there are bats there, then there's, you've either got to, I believe, um, create new space for the bats to be there and make sure that they're kind of not too disrupted during the process. However, I think for most species that, isn't that level of um protection and so you can kind of go onto greenfield sites Uh, greenfield is in you know um not previously built on sites and not have to mitigate for the losses that you've made in biodiversity i think a lot of people are calling for that to to change and i believe there's going to be a new there's actually the government are currently in the process of rewriting the um planning policies so that's probably something to keep an eye on and um obviously the new environment bill in the uk has recently been um is being formed and is about to be kind of i believe uh, there's going to be consulting it's going to be consulted on with the public and i think it's looking for kind of greater um scrutiny to make sure that the environment bill and the planning bill make sure that they actually complement each other so that you can't um just you know destroy habitats for for new buildings because there are methods there to um you know mitigate for it um Mm -hmm. at least try to mitigate for it and not um just destroy you know if you if you need to build a building um a way of mitigating it as opposed to just not putting anything in in, instead so I think people are looking going to be looking quite closely at that because that's been a part of policy that is is being changed quite a lot at the moment with kind of wider UK political mm-hmm. um okay. yeah, yeah thank, you. <laughs> thank you very thank much you. it was it was really great question uh thank you because I actually got a uh, got similar question with uh, uh uh having having talk uh, for 
for someone else's students in UK and I didn't know the UK policy because I would know the Czech policy. So mm -hmm. it, is, it is actually very interesting in, uh, in Czechia when you are submitting, uh, submitting a new building for the building permission, you actually have to have to go through the through the ecologic report and you have to you have to have ecologic report and uh, you have to go through the environmental authorities and uh, they can actually complain and specifically if you have protected the areas uh, you have to have a, a serious a serious ecological uh, survey yeah so there are ecological consultants that are definitely have to be brought in at at some point I'm not this isn't my ex area of expertise mm -hmm. kind of planning we are losing you we, we are losing you we don't uh, don't hear you. can you hear me now yes ah oh, great so um yeah, I was just saying, so planning isn't isn't my area of, of expertise. So um, I can't say for sure, but we definitely do have kind of environmental, UK has environmental consultancies that have to kind of be brought in, especially for kind of larger builds um, uh, to, to kind of see that damage. But I think legally it's only the protected species that need to be mitigated for. Um, and then there are, again, kind of protected sites. So we have... Um, uh, triple SI sites, so, which are sites of special scientific interest, um, obviously the national parks, um, areas of outstanding natural beauty, and all of those will have certain other criteria around development. Um, and also towns and cities can kind of have their own planning structures as well. So Cardiff Council will have their own kind of planning principles that will sit within kind of the wider government. So yeah, it's quite a it's quite a big topic um and something that would be probably you know depending on what your projects evolve into really interesting to look into specifically for cardiff and um i guess um if some of you haven't um you know grown up in the uk as well it's worth remembering that kind of uh the uk government i say wales has its own government and that sits kind of somewhat separately to the UK government and some issues so the environment is a devolved issue so Wales can make its own decisions on its on the environment whereas um kind of and same with Scotland and Northern Ireland and England so um whereas some issues are central issues that um are have to be kind of addressed at, at a full country level as opposed to individual countries okay thank you I I uh, want to share the very happy news uh, that uh, I am uh, sitting on Biodiversity Action Plan Committee at Cardiff University. And our uh, action plan uh, has, been, uh, has been accepted. So uh, mm -hmm. from, uh, from now, actually, and it, it, it has been accepted and it, is, uh, it uh, starts with the new year that it has to be respected. Uh, our Cardiff University now has to has to follow the action plan where we will be restoring a lot of uh, uh, urban environment on uh, our campuses together with the connectivity with all Cardiff landscape and we collaborate with Cardiff Council Council and uh, uh, from this uh, this point actually we will consult it which is uh, which is very great news that there were no issues with uh, with our plan and uh, uh, it seems like uh, in the future there will be a lot of uh, new habitats across Cardiff cam University campuses. Oh, that's brilliant news. And we, 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 will, we will definitely want to bring, uh, we discussed that last year, right? <laughs> we, will, yes. we, we will get uh, get in touch uh, when, uh, when we launch the, the action. Anybody uh, has, uh, has some more questions? Uh, please, please ask. Yeah, hi. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, so in the beginning you showed um, some of the uh, species in Cardiff and like, a lot of them I didn't know about. So I was wondering if there was some resources where we could look at um, the kind of species that are here or yeah, in Cardiff and um, you know, like what kind of threats they face and just some, you know, some of that information I think would be really useful. Yeah, that sounds great. So um, I'll pop a link in the chat, um, which is basically an atlas that you can search for all the different 
species in a specific area so that will help kind of um look at you know what you can find in um Grangetown or different areas in Cardiff and then in terms of finding out more about the different species and their their own threats um you know depending on what that species is there's kind of I guess a lots of different charities but also yeah the charities and also kind of almost encyclopedia type areas on um online um so if there were for example you know if one of those species was birds obviously the rsvb has um you know a page on the website for kind of every species of bird you could um want to find in the uk but then if it was a mammal then there's a uh, there's a charity called the Mammal Society. Um, if it was a marine or water species, then again, there's separate ones. So um, in terms of the species in Cardiff, um, I'm just trying to think if there's anything, another resource. The Cardiff Council actually have a wildlife in Cardiff um, brochure, I believe. I'll just try and find it. All right, yeah, I'm just looking at the one you sent and it's quite, uh, it's, it's a big list, it's, it's really useful. Ah, welcome, I'm far away, so I just... Um, so, oh yeah, I've got here a biodiversity of Cardiff booklet link to it. So I'll just pop that in the chat as well. That was looks like it was compiled by Cardiff Council. Um, so it might have a bit more detail on some of the some of the species there. Perfect. Thank you. That is uh, that is really. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I really enjoyed the talk too. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Any more uh, any more questions, comments? Please ask now. Don't, I, <laughs> uh, at least last year just uh, kindly agreed that you can pop her an email, but uh, <laughs> uh, can they can they can they still do that? Yeah, that's fine. My email is on the presentation. Um, so hopefully everyone can see that because it was on the yeah, yeah, Google I'm, share. Am I allow, allowed to share uh, share the presentation just with the students? Obviously not. Uh, not uh, yeah, that's fine. There, but so so I will share it uh, with students. But please ask now. Don't uh, don't bother just uh, <laughs> uh, with hundred emails. So, <laughs> so if you do anything now, please uh, please do. Okay, I have another question. Mm -hmm. um, so from your experience working in um, all the different projects, uh, how or what's the most effective way to get people to be more engaged, like the public, to be mm -hmm. more engaged and, you know, to uh, see how important um, like biodiversity and um, just the wildlife is, is you know? Mm. So we do kind of a few mixture of different ways on the project. So one of them is kind of just setting up in the in the park with activities. So we have a, lots of different types of engagement activities to um, mainly aimed at families. Um, so that might be uh, a, a, a color game. We're going to try and find loads of different objects in nature, which um, are all the different colors and see, you know, what they can find and, you know, having a discovery and discussions about that and, and games. And that's kind of more about stopping people, um, you know, when they're in the parks and, and trying to engage with them in that point. Um, mm -hmm. But also working with other organisations who are kind of also putting on engagement activities, but maybe you could um, swing it and have a bit more of a, an environmental theme. So we work quite a bit with um, TechnoQuest, which is a science museum down at the Bay, um, the museum, and also kind of Cardiff Council Hubs. So they'll often run, they'll want to kind of run um, fun things for people to get involved in um, and we kind of help them put more of a nature nature theme on that um, and the other way is to kind of working with other community groups who might similarly want an activity but not be too much not mind too much if it's actually to do with the environment um, but you know we can go and uh, you know find the local the small green space or large green space near them and, and work out what activity we can do. Um, I think the main important thing is to make sure that it's applicable for the, the kind of the local setting and understand what those people are, are looking for from, um, you know, are, do they want to improve their space for wildlife? So 
are you able to kind of give some advice or resources or tips about how to kind of um, help them in that way or are they looking for you know activities or events which is where the kind of the project comes in so I think it's about making sure that it's a two-way relationship so um, you know they were helping us but we're also helping them um, and yeah I guess I think I believe that a lot of people do care about the environment or don't necessarily but don't necessarily either have access to it yet or know what to do to help um, I think environmental awareness is is massively on the upcreek uh, sorry on the increase at the moment so I think especially for urban settings a lot of the kind of information online does tend to be I feel aimed at a more um, less urban and maybe more rural communities who maybe do have gardens and you know if we're talking about you know people who are living in a city how do you um, who some who do have gardens but how do we make kind of the things to get involved with really applicable to people who don't have a garden or might not have many outdoor space um, and yeah less about kind of maybe big rolling fields full of wildflowers when actually that's maybe not as applicable um, in kind of a city centre. Yeah yeah I've definitely noticed that that um, there tends to be a, it, it, like the people who live in cities when it comes to them caring about the environment it's kind of ignored um, and so like I found, mm. that, I found that with myself too like whenever I'm back home and you know it's more of a rural rural area I live in like I, I have more of a you know I'm more conscious but then when I'm in Cardiff and in the city and center like it doesn't it, it almost seems as if that world doesn't exist so um yeah I think it's, yeah. it's important to kind of bring those two together for sure yeah definitely and like you say it's also being able to see where that where that space is so a new part of the project that we're hoping to release in a few weeks is um kind of wild trails in Cardiff so helping people discover new outdoor spaces and kind of um routes in the city um so I can share the link when that's up and up and running but again to try and like make it not feel you know if people want to have that outdoors time that it's not always got to be in the kind of built up spaces because there are green spaces in the city but often it's quite hard to discover them when you're kind of going about your day to day um mm -hmm. and where to kind of yeah spot the wildlife right yeah that would be really interesting to look at that i would have a question mm -hmm. i often uh, often uh, get myself but i would uh, i would like to uh, I already built my argumentation, but I would like to hear your argumentation. You know, I often receive a question specifically by some ur conservative urbanists. Uh, they believe that uh, uh, wildlife doesn't belong to the city, that, uh, that uh, cities belong to people, and we should protect the biodiversity elsewhere, whilst uh, cities are human habitat that uh, should not mess up uh, mess up with, uh, with other species. Uh, uh, I would like to hear uh, your argumentation when, uh, when, uh, when uh, discussing, the, I, I'm sure you met this, uh, this opinion already or. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I guess, I think in terms of, um, you know, the percentage of land, then I can, can kind of see to some extent the argument of, you know, why not make these areas where we have loads of land make them way better for wildlife but I think the main thing is that connection to nature um you know like we were just discussing you know if you if you never see wildlife and you never see even green spaces even if it's as simple as you know birds in the trees or um you know bees when the flowers come out or if there's not any flowers like at what point do you completely detach yourself from even being part of nature and part of the environment um and I think you know it can be quite a dangerous position to get to where humans are completely separated or feel completely separated from from the rest of the natural world um and if that you know if, if we keep going down that route then who who's going to care about the environment um longer term because we're kind of where well, we're at a point really where we need kind of environmental and sustainable thinking to be coming into all areas of society and business um because otherwise you know well we all know that things aren't looking good in terms of climate change and biodiversity loss so I kind of feel like it's not yeah it's, it just the the whole connection to nature part would just be lost if we removed nature from from the city um and 
yeah the joy I guess the joy and the fun that it brings having you know birds visiting your garden or you know even flowers and trees and you know we need even if people want to have allotments and grow things you, you know most of the time you're going to need soil that is um you know fertile and bees to come and pollinate the plants and yeah I think it would be quite sad if city, I know there are cities that have very little um green space or wildlife but I think it would be sad if that trajectory just kept going <laughs> yeah thank you any more questions questions comments uh, or applause <laughs> <laughs> Please, uh, please go uh, ahead. So okay, there is applause. Let's uh, let's uh, wait. Uh, let's wait uh, one one more minute for last question. Okay, if nobody is asking, well, thank you so much, Jess. It, uh, you were always uh, inspired. Inspiring as always. Uh, oh, thank you. It, it, it is really great, and thank you so much for the work uh, work you are doing. And uh, I love that it is actually somebody with architectural background because I believe architects are quite uh, quite ba backwards uh, in uh, in those fields. I mean, <laughs> but, uh, it's not uh, not enough. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well. I yeah. Thank you, everyone. And um, I'll send you, I'll just put together a few more links and attach the PowerPoint, Mari, so, you, so you've got it in that format as well. Okay, um, thank you. But it'll probably take an hour or so to come through, given how long it took before. <laughs> so. Please, uh, please, everybody give, uh, give, uh, give applause to Jess because uh, uh, it has been, it has been uh, great. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. And then, um, yeah, just uh, I put on the email, there's my email there, but there's also our project email. So, um, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. depending on what it is, we might, you know, we might not know, but we can take a stab at it. <laughs> thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. And thank you for agreeing that the students could message you. But, uh, for, you know, first uh, search the information before you start. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, oh, that's thank great. You. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jess. You're I welcome. Thank you, everyone. Recording.